Hello viewers, good morning and welcome. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Ron Grant and you're watching 284 Media out of Rotown Tortola in the beautiful British Virgin Islands. Joining me out of the U.S. Virgin Islands this morning is Senator Janelle Saru. Honorable Janelle K. Saru is a sitting USVI Senator in the 34th Legislator of the United States Virgin Islands. Saru, a strong advocate for a progressive U.S. Virgin Islands, was re-elected to the 34th Legislator on November 3rd, 2020. Now, during her time in the legislature, Senator Saru legislated bills which sought to promote and provide the territory's youth, workforce, environment, culture, and economy. Her signature legislators include the State Apprenticeship Bill, Division of Festivals, Women, Children, and Families Act, WAPA Management Oversight, Toxic Sunscreen Ban, Gas Stations Limitation, Public Service Commission Expansion, and the expansion of the Pharmaceutical Assistance Program. An active chairman of the Committee on Rules and Judiciary in the 33rd Legislature, Senator Saru rallied for greater accountability, transparency, innovation, representation, and revenue generation. Now, of course, beyond legislation, Senator Saru has created opportunities to make an immediate impact on her beloved community, working collaboratively with other public leaders and private entities, recognizing, she says, the needs for children to be engaged and carry on tradition. Senator Saru formed the Culture Shock Mokujumbi Troop, a troop dedicated to learning the art and history of the Mokujumbi. Another project the senator holds dear to her heart is the Sounds of the Virgin Isles, which aimed at showcasing and raising funds for the music and arts program to the public schools. Now, Sounds of the Virgin Islands has raised over 10K for the music and arts program over its last two years. The senator's passion for service, her community, education, and excellence, combined with her leadership skills, has left a positively unique mark in the 33rd legislator and greater motivation within her to continue the work set out before her in the 34th legislator. Senator Janelle K. Saru uh, firmly believes that the United States of Virgin Islands is ready for young, invigorating leadership, vision that will prosperously propel the territory into the future. Viewers, it is indeed an honor to be joined this morning by the warrior herself, the Honorable Janelle K. Saru. Today we discuss her first 100 days in office since being re-elected, diversity in the region, gun violence in the USVI, the state of COVID-19 in the USVI, and equality and diversity in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's a conversation you don't want to miss. We'll be right back with the Honorable Janelle K. Saru after a word from our sponsors. You're watching 284 Media, and I'm Ron Grant. The wind up. What the hell? I'm freaking out. Is about to It's always a pleasure coming to you live and direct from the... What's poppin'? What's really good? Davis has won it for the Lakers! Viewers, welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us. Senator Saru, welcome to 284 Media. Good morning and happy Thursday to you. Thank you so much for your time. I know you had quite a few meetings and interviews earlier today, but you still took the time out to speak with us, and we are so appreciative. Welcome. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for having me. All right. I want to begin by walking us through your first 100 days in office since being re-elected to the 34th legislator in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, tell us about what you've been up to. Well, we began a term um, with a new committee, the Committee on Disaster Recovery and Infrastructure. So far, we've had about seven committee hearings, uh, 12 uh, agencies before us to include the hospitals, the Department of Education, um, WAPA. Those are our big, our big um, agencies that require a lot of oversight and attention. So we're able to bring to the public's awareness the recovery process, the delays in the recovery process, um, we've also been tackling food security and securing the fisheries on the federal level. For our fishermen, we've moved the moratorium on gas stations legislation. Um, we've also passed about three important legislations as far as the PSC is concerned, the Public Services Commission, which um, is the regulatory consumer agency to protect um, ratepayers against any harmful acts by our utility companies. We revamped the PSC and their board. We had a um, legislation that would actually look at the PSC, the oversight function, um, that would enable them to have greater oversight over the water and power authority. So we had two bills, PSC, the PSC authority bill. Um, we had the 
moratorium on gas stations bill, and we also had the bill on WAPA and making sure that our boards have more technical expertise um, as to not repeat the mistakes of the past. So we have, we've moved legislation. We're going to push, it's, it was vetoed, two bills were vetoed. We're going to push okay. for override um, in the upcoming July session. And we've just been on the move between town halls, legislations, oversight of disaster recovery, and now the budget season is upon us. I'm a member of the Committee of Finance. So we're dissecting the government's budget because we have to um, pass a budget by September 30th. All right. Recently, I noticed that you uh, went over to St. John to speak with uh, the fishers over there in that uh, uh, territory, uh, particularly with some difficulties that they've been having. Now, this is no stranger to the region, particularly over in the BVI. We, too, uh, have our issues as it pertains to agriculture, farming, and fishers. Uh, what are some of the pressing concerns of the fishermen over in uh, St. John, uh, particularly during these very difficult times of COVID-19? Like the BVI, there's like this precarious relationship um, between I would say the colonizer, but the mother colony and the, yes. the territory. So we have issues on the federal side and the local side. On the federal side, of course, you know, the northern part of St. John, um, they've declared that under the Clinton administration, they've declared that national monuments. So all of okay. those areas deemed um, areas where oh, they've been prohibited the, um, the right to fish in those areas. And of course, the other portion extends into British waters. So... The fishermen are basically locked out of the northern part of the island to fish. On the southern shore, you had five banks at one point in time. The federal government, they relegated the fishermen to just one bank, which is Buckle Point. Um, then there used to be five buoys at Buckle Point. Now they're down to one buoy. Um, and then the boats can't, they're not allowing any boats 16 feet or more. Um, in the area, so the boats, the size of the boat um, has been, it's been an issue. And then, of course, you can't anchor as well over there. So yeah. our fishermen are left with no place to fish. And that does affect wow. food security. On top of the fact that where boats used to launch at one point belong to the local government. And somehow, over the years, the national government, well, the national park has claimed that property as theirs. So fishermen are subject to, or at the mercy of a national park, allowing them to go behind the gate to launch their boats. So the entire industry um, has its challenges. And of course, locally, we've imposed, at the request of the federal government, we've imposed a 30-year moratorium. So St. John roughly has three to five registered commercial licensed fishermen. That's also an issue on the local side. And of course, we have to build some infrastructure, a fish market, a dock, a ramp. Um, so the federal government has made it hard, but locally we have perpetuated the issue as well. So we've written legislation and it went into legal counsel two days ago to appropriate roughly $2 million from the St. John Capital Improvement Fund for the construction of a, um, a fish house, a dock, and a ramp locally. And of course, we met with a congresswoman yesterday and the day before on ways for her to champion through NOAA, which is the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and um, the National Park Service on the federal side to give us some leeway on opening the fisheries. Wonderful. I have to touch on gun violence, Senator. That has plagued the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, from St. Thomas to St. Croix and even St. John has not been exempted from various acts of violence. Now, the violence displayed throughout the USVI is no doubt crippling and devastating to communities. As a sitting senator, what say you on the present level of gun violence across the U.S. Virgin Islands? And where are, where are we exactly in seeking to uh, get it under control? Uh, violence is not just uh, a one, uh, it's, it has to be a multi prong approach in dealing with gun violence. What we did in the 30s, third legislature, the, the term before this, we focused a lot on families and communities and strengthening families and communities. We passed the Women, Children, and Families Act, um, which would assist families in you know, just creating stronger families. There were so many components to it, it was an omnibus bill of various components of assisting the mother, those who are incarcerated, um, behavioral and wellness exams for our students because we're catching our students too late. Um, as a former mm. educator, I have students who are being caught 
Um, you know, they probably need an IEP, a 504 program, and those are programs aimed at differentiated learning. So when we don't catch them at that point, they become frustrated with school and the behavior becomes destructive. And of course, from that, you enter into um, a life of crime or destructive behaviors. So we focus a lot on trying to create opportunities. We've also championed um, athletics and um, the arts. Sounds of the Virgin Isles, we promoted the arts and it, statistics and data shows that when our students participate in the arts or sports, they do better academically because those are in fact academic interventions. But everything cannot be legislated. Um, hmm. At some point, there has to be a revolution of values within our community. And of course, on the federal side, our borders are so permeable that between us and the BBI, we've become the transshipment port. A lot of the yes. cocaine that comes from South America through our waters onto the mainland. Um, that's also an issue. So we, we've tried to tackle it legislatively. We've tried to champion um, a lot of programs and causes, even Culture Shack, a bunch of little brown and black boys and girls learning the art of Mokujumbi. Um, I, I still coach the CAHS varsity Wonderful. volleyball team. Yeah, thank you. So, but avoid all of that if you don't have a strong family, a community presence, a strong education system, you always see a recurrence of crime, you know, and, and sometimes you point back to the government a lot. But when you look at Parents have a role. Parents have to teach. I mean, of parents course. have to parent. Sorry, right? The, the the government can't reach the children at night. Government don't attend PTA meetings. Government can't say, hey, log on to, to virtual school today. Of course, government has its role. The church. The church has a role, too. The church has to go to the crooked places and make them straight. You know, the church is not only within the four walls. They have a role as well. And historically speaking, Churches have played an integral role in the civil rights movement, um, in, in the role of apartheid, that Archbishop Desmond Tutu, you know. I mean, Jesus was the greatest agitator and a politician known mm. to man. So as we continue on the, the process or trying to curb crime, we have to understand that church has a role, government has a role, parents have a role, the community has a role as well. You know, we continue to revert bad behavior and then the style is to have a deceased person on your shirt. And you're at a funeral drinking rum or smoking and throwing mm. it up for your boy or daddy. You know, and that's that's a culture we've created. And we, we say freedom is a must when we know that some young men were like menaces to society. So overall, the crime rate is just not, um, it's not incumbent on one branch or one particular agency to address crime. It has to be a holistic approach, and we just have to simply want better for ourselves as a as a community. I agree because it's still, uh, as we hear so often, but it still takes a village to raise a child. Uh, speaking of family, you come from a very diverse Caribbean uh, heritage and background, of course, with Kitishan roots and Krusian roots. Uh, speak to the importance of inclusion and diversity within the Caribbean, and how has your uh, diversity and your background and heritage allowed you to uh, better yourself and be exactly who you are today? Well, we have a misnomer in the USVI. We tend to think that we are US first. And for me, I am Caribbean first. And then, of course, by nature, where I'm born, I am a US citizen. But my mom is from Kayan, St. Kitts, and my grandfather is from Sandy Point, St. Kitts. So I lived in St. Kitts, and I attended the, William, the Dr. William Connor um, Primary Elementary, not primary, Dr. William Connor Primary School. Um, in, in the village in Greenland. So I lived in St. Kitts. I attended Girls Brigade and I attended Wesley Methodist Church and my grandfather was the longest serving speaker of the house um, under the Kennedy Simmons administration. And then of course, then as a Douglas became the prime minister following that. Um, so going to St. Kitts between um, the holidays and summer, I had the ability to be immersed in um, Kittish and politics and I remember running for office the first time and we had red shirts and my grandfather refused to wear my campaign shirt because wow. that was the labor part. So, you know, it was, it was funny. He's like, you know, I can't wear this shirt. I have to go, I have to wear it to bed. So we had a, it's interesting to see the dynamics in the British system. And then my dad is from St. Croix, Fredrickson. Um, so I have that Queen Mary spirit, um, Sometimes I'm just, you know, burn the whole place down, start over. And, <laughs> and I, I see it 
me. <laughs> I see it coming through me many times and I have to temper myself and um because I get frustrated when there's a lack of progress. So mm. I've had, you know, between the seeing the British side and the Crucian side, I think it's allowed me to um be well rounded in my politics. Wonderful. Uh, all across the world, particularly in the United States, persons are presently celebrating and observing Pride Month. Now, you have never shown away uh, from the fact that you are a lesbian woman, a proud member of the LGBT community. I want to understand from you as an openly gay woman, what does Pride Month mean to you? Uh, what does it signify and why is it so important? Um, you have so many people that live in a closet because as a society, we dictate. Um, we're very judgmental. So you have so many undercover men and women, and pride is just to celebrate freedom. Um, the Constitution begins with the people, not we the okay. blacks, not we the white, not we whatever. The Declaration of Independence, our founding fathers, um, said that we were all created equal. Um, and, and you have a government that should become all inclusive. And in order to promote as a policymaker, for me to promote a level of inclusion, I do no justice to anyone living in the shadows. You know, it's important for me to normalize the conversations and to allow people to say, hey, I may be a lesbian, but that is a small part of who I am. You know, it's it's not the entire fabric. And, and we have to look beyond a person's sexual preference, who they choose to love, and see what they can offer people. So often we stigmatize you know, you know, whether it's because you're black or you're a minority or you're, you know, LGBTQ. Um, we do that quite often in our politics, in our overall society. And I, I feel that I want it to be the change I want to see. That's what Gandhi says. Um, so I want to pave the way for those that come behind me to just live their truth, you know. And it's my so pride for me is to show up as my authentic self every day, hoping to inspire somebody else. Wonderful. Most importantly, I must ask, where would you say the U.S. Virgin Islands is presently as it pertains to diversity and equality? And perhaps how far have we come in this regard? And perhaps how much further do we still have to go? So if I'm to have a frank conversation, we have had governors before me that were gay. We've had people in the institution that were gay, but there was this don't ask, don't tell policy. Okay. I think we've come a long way because I talk about my sexuality. I post a picture behind the rain, in front of the rainbow. And the fact that I, on election night, I was the highest vote getter on election night. We've come a long way because people did not vote based on my preference, but what I do for the community and what I continue to do. So that in itself spoke volumes that those the, the seniors and the middle-aged and the young didn't care who I love. Mm -hmm. They cared about how I presented them. So I think we've come a long way, but we have a longer way to go. All right. You spoke about being the highest vote getter uh, on election night. I want to talk about young leadership in the 21st century. You have been known to be a warrior for, warrior for the people, representing the people, uh, the underprivileged, the underspoken for. And I have to touch on the fact that uh, throughout the territory, not only the U.S. Virgin Islands, the British Virgin Islands, but on a regional level, uh, there still seems to be some apprehension as it pertains to young leadership, whether it be in politics or out of politics. I need you to speak about your passion um, and your drive to be the voice of the people, despite your age, despite of your sexual preference. Uh, you come out, you show up, and you show out. How important is that? And what would you say to young persons throughout the Caribbean region who are perhaps apprehensive uh, about leading in whatever capacity it is? If you have something to offer, then um, just just enter the arena. Sometimes we allow fear. The greatest, I, I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt who said that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And fear cripples us from, from being great. So it's incumbent to, like I said earlier, be authentic, show up as you are, um, come as you are, and understand that you are enough. And we live in a Christian society, technically. And if we're going to go back to the biblical teachings, the Bible said, a child shall lead them, right? So if a child shall lead them, then that is a universal message to say that, you know, young people do have something to offer. And if we draw on our history, when you look at the, um, 
over in, in South Africa, the apartheid movement, it began with young people. The civil rights movement began with young people in Woolworths refusing to, to give up their seats. When you look at the Iranian revolution and, and the overthrow of, of Ayatollah Khomeini, you had a revolution of young um, people that wanted change. Every movement in this world began with young people. That's our history. We're at a point where we just don't, we, we, we have the, the courage to risk what the others think is wise, and we have that fight in us, and there's no trepidation. So if you have something to offer, um, walk in your truth, own your truth, own your greatness, and go forth. Appreciate that advice so much. Uh, Senator, to date, the USVI has had uh, 28 unfortunate deaths as a result of COVID-19. Like us here in the BVI, the USVI is not exempted from the effects of COVID. Most recently, we saw the Bryant administration introducing a vaccine lottery. Uh, tell us your thoughts on the vaccine lottery. First of all, do you support it? And where is the USVI presently in the fight against COVID-19 from your seat? Well, yesterday we had a, the Command Disaster Recovery event and we discussed, we had DHS before us, Department of Human Services. And we have a, a home, uh, uh, we have a lot of senior homes that are not COVID-19 retrofitted. The configuration is still more like a big open room mm -hmm. where most of our seniors in um, affected 11 of, um, at the time it was about 15 residents, 11 tested positive for died. Um, so when we have CARES Act funding, that's the name of the funding that the federal government has given us to tackle COVID-19. And when we don't take, we haven't presented a case to the federal government to say, hey, can we use our CARES Act funding to configure our nursing homes, our senior facilities to protect our seniors or pay to retrofit a place to relocate them so that they can have greater protection against um, contracting COVID. Mm -hmm. When that is not a priority, but having a lottery for a vaccine becomes the the marketing tool, then it does leave me cause for concern. I do not agree with um, trying to, in a sense, bribe or entice citizens to take a vaccine. When we're already about close to about roughly 50% of the population we're getting there um, have been vaccinated. And we're on a, a mission. And people are taking it a bit more serious as as we continue and there's more education on the vaccine, the normalcy of it, seeing your friend take it, your mom take it. But that's not the approach to get people to become vaccinated, especially when we can do more with our COVID-19 funds. All right. Of course, no country senator us? or government administration seems to be free from corruption allegations among its various government bodies and entities. You have spoken up publicly many times. You have asked uh, grueling questions to the uh, various uh, departments and entities about holding persons accountable within the civil service. Where is, we're presently in the BVI, we're presently going through the stages and investigations of a commission of inquiry. I want you to speak to the need for accountability and transparency in any government, and where would you say the USVI is in this regard? I look at, I speak in layman's terms a lot, and I think that comes from me being a former educator. And government is like a relationship with two mm -hmm. lovers. When you begin to um, lie by omission and not, and not become transparent, then you cause distrust in the relationship. And you cause issues where your lover is kind of questioning, well, he got a text today, who's texting him? Um, she got a text, who's texting her? Why are you stepping outside to have a conversation? What's going on? And government has to be treated in the same regard. When you don't communicate with the masses, when you don't tell the taxpayer how you spent their funds, um, when there's no level of transparency um, between and the relationship, the relationship in government would be, or in society would be, And that's where you have governments fighting, where you have branches fighting, because there is not a level of transparency. On the accountability portion, we scream for accountability, I found, and this is not germane to the VI, but across the globe. We want accountability, but we pick and choose who we're going to hold accountable. The Republican mm -hmm. Party wants accountability. The Republican Party wanted 
Hillary Clinton to go to jail or be held accountable for the emails. But because Trump is one of their own, then we can't hold Trump accountable. We can't vote to impeach him. We wanted to jail Hillary. You know, and that's just an example outside of the Caribbean and the territories yes. that we, if we're going to talk about accountability, we have to be serious about the word accountability. We just can't fling it around because we, we so choose. As far as where we are in the territory, I would say we are light years behind on the accountability mm -hmm. component. We, we have an office of the Inspector General, um, the IG office. They've continued to publish reports of misuse of funds. Um, we published in various areas the PFA. Um, there's a report on WAPA. There's a report somewhere else. And these reports do not yield arrest. They do not yield changes in that agency. So I, I, if I'm to be honest about where we are as far as that is concerned, we're not where we should be. Thank you so much for your honesty as always. Senator Saru, we thank you so much for your time and of course checking in uh, with the people of the British Virgin Islands. We continue to wish you much success and thank you for uh, your truth yeah. and uh, continuing to be a warrior for the people. Uh, it was indeed a pleasure and we continue to wish you uh, the very best as you continue to execute your duties. Thank you so much. I appreciate it and thank you for having me and I want to continue to pray and root for the BVI because we're only a few miles apart and we share so much in common. So you always have a friend in the USBI. Indeed. Thank you so much, viewers. That's all the time we have, uh, but that is not all the content. Uh, that was just the Honorable Janelle Saru, uh, sitting U.S. VI Senator in the 34th Legislator of the United States Virgin Islands, uh, touching on a number of issues that are affecting uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands, but of course, uh, uh, quite familiar to us also here in the BVI. We thank her for her time, and viewers, I'll see you a bit later with more content, both locally, regionally, and internationally. Uh, your source for honest and impartial news. I'm Ron Grant. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.